I'm Jo Miller. I'm Andrew Wibberley. And I'm Vicky Churcher. And together we are the co-chairs of the IPTF. Welcome to IPOR, which stands for Income Protection Awareness Week. Except this year, we've reclaimed the A in IPOR and turned awareness into action. For us, IPOR has always been about more than watching some hopefully informative and entertaining content and going back to the day job. IPOR is about being inspired, learning from your peers and some subject matter experts and doing something differently to grow your income protection sales. So welcome to Income Protection Action Week. We really appreciate your support of the IPTF, particularly if you're a returning viewer. Thank you for your loyalty. If this is your first time, welcome. We hope you enjoy the week ahead. It's my first time too. We know your time is precious, so we've tried to make sure that every minute of our schedule is packed with informative, inspiring, and most importantly, helpful content. We've taken the feedback from previous events, noted what worked particularly well, and designed an agenda with something for everyone in mind. Make sure you register for each session, and that way you'll receive a reminder each day, as well as automatically receiving your all-important CPD certificate after you've attended the live broadcast. So, as is customary, let's take a look at what the week ahead holds. Consider today a State of the Nation address. We'll be taking a look at what is going on in the IP market and sharing the data we have from our members and other sources to understand what is going on and how we can work together to focus on growth. Beyond the data, we'll be speaking to some advisors to get a sense of what they're seeing on the front line and the types of conversations they're having. Now, of course, it wouldn't be right to look at the market over the past year and look forward without considering the impact of consumer duty. So yes, that's right, less than 10 minutes into IPOR 2024 and we've said it already. We'll be talking with the Consumer Duty Alliance about the impact that consumer duty has had and touching on subjects related to consumer duty, such as signposting and the importance of storytelling. So bingo cards ticked on consumer duty. We'll then be talking with Paul Roberts from CI Experts about how critical illness and income protection can work together and what their critical thinking research revealed about consumer needs and preferences. And finally, we'll be bringing our first session of the week to a close with a coaching session focused on advisor mindset and preparing for successful client conversations. Based on the feedback received last year, we'll be including some coaching on most days this week as we really focus on turning the why for income protection into the how to make it happen. Today's session is led by Julie Botha, who works for the Vitality Academy and who you may have heard on episode five of our podcast, Let's Talk IP. You definitely won't want to miss this one. Now, what does Tuesday look like, Joe? So Tuesday's session is called How to Sell Less Income Protection. Perhaps that's a little misleading as we won't actually be suggesting advisors sell less income protection, rather we'll be highlighting common mistakes that are easily made and in another of his masterclasses, Matt Chapman will be taking us through how to avoid them and most importantly, what to do instead. We'll be bringing the whole session to life via a series of role plays courtesy of some of our seven ambassadors so that you can see the suggestions that Matt make, makes brought to life. Finally, with most of tomorrow's session focusing on coaching to improve advisors' advice processes, we'll end the day with a discussion about the consequences of not getting it right and the power of personal stories. As if that isn't enough, we're attempting something completely different on Tuesday with a live session immediately after our broadcast on LinkedIn. So if you have any questions for Matt on any of the content you've seen, this is your chance. Vicky, take us through Wednesday. What's in store? On Wednesday, we'll be considering different types of client and how having a strategy on client types can really help you grow your business. We'll be speaking to an advisor panel on the types of clients they deal with and why. Following on from the success of last year, we'll be hearing from Rosalia Lazara on creating content to use on social media. And a heads up, we'll be using Canva, which you might want to sign up to if you haven't already. We know as an advisor, your focus on giving the best advice to your client and social media can often seem like a huge challenge. So we hope you'll find this session really useful. 
Finally, on Wednesday, we welcome back Gary Waters, who will be providing our coaching session focused on objection handling for different types of client. Another great how-to session. Andrew, over to you for a rundown on Thursday's content. Thanks, Vicky. We're introducing another new topic for IPOR on Thursday when we take a look at business protection. We'll be talking to a panel of expert advisors about the different products, who they're suitable for, and the process of advising on them. Our coaching focus for Thursday is equipping advisors to deal with those conversations which are not necessarily straightforward. So whether that's pre-sales in discussing ratings or exclusions, spotting vulnerabilities in clients and knowing how to handle them, or recognizing when income protection isn't the right solution, Catherine Knowles will be offering us her expertise on these topics and many more. Next, we'll be putting the spotlight on claims and looking at the advisor role in the claims process and how you can support your clients should they have to claim. We'll be getting insight from some of our insurer members here. And once again, we'll be hosting a live social session following the Thursday broadcast, giving you the chance to ask the experts. So make a note of any questions you have and join us on LinkedIn. Now that brings us nicely to Friday. So what do we have in store for then, Joe? So back by popular demand, we'll be considering retention and the importance of regular reviews with clients, as well as touching on the consequences of not doing so. We'll also be discussing value added services, what's on offer, what take up rates are like, and how these can form part of those regular discussions with clients. Naturally, we'll also be reflecting on the week and considering some of the key takeaways from our work so far this year, definitely ending on a high. Now, back to our change of name, Income Protection Action Week. As always with IPOR, it would be great to hear how it's helping you by giving a different perspective and signposting best practice, because that's a large part of the reason we do this. Your feedback and the comments we see online really help shape what we do, and we want to measure the impact of IPOR. So once again, we're asking you to get involved online. Last year was amazing, but we're determined to top it this year. Share your IPOR thoughts, comments, and reflections on LinkedIn and Instagram. Be sure to tag IPTF and make sure you use the following hashtags. Let's talk IP, because of IPOR, and IPOR 2024. What will you do differently having watched iPod? What was your favourite light bulb moment? We want to know, so don't be shy. And remember, your observation could inspire someone else. So let's get started with iPod 2024 and take a look at what is happening with, with income protection sales and the market. And whichever way we look at it, it's a good news story. The income protection market has continued to grow. And although the amount of growth varies very slightly depending on exactly which figures you look at, the direction of travel is definitely positive. And this is positive in the face of an otherwise stagnant or even contracting market. So January's Q1 update for this year showed an 8% growth in APE, and Swiss Re's Term and Health Watch named income protection as the biggest winner in 2023, with APE up 18% from the previous year. This is also reflected in the NMG infographic that we shared on social media this morning. So do take a look at that. Finally, the ABI reported that income protection policy sales hit 247,000 in 2023, which is the highest on record. And 97% of those products were sold with advice, according to their report. So great news, right? We wanted to see income protection sales increase and they are. Job done, right? Well. Not quite. Sales are on the way up, but from a very low starting point, and it's important to step back and consider income protection coverage across the UK population. How accessible is income protection to the population? And of course, we need to remind ourselves of the need and why we must keep the momentum in the income protection market. Financial resilience, or lack of it, has never been under more scrutiny. Against a backdrop of a cost of living crisis and record levels of people off work long term sick, household finances are a frequent topic of conversation. And rightly so, as data from the FCA Financial Lives research shows. In the past 12 months, 77% of people revealed that they had worked more just to make ends meet, 
44% stopped saving or investing so they could make ends meet, and 23% of people had used savings to cover everyday living costs. Perhaps the bleakest statistic of all for us is that 22% of people had cancelled a protection policy in response to the cost of living crisis. It's bleak for the industry to lose policyholders who we've previously managed to convince of the value of protection, but it's also bleak for the population when we consider what it means for them. Figures from the money charity suggest average household credit card debt is just under £2,500. And that's where income protection comes in. We collectively have a role to play to educate consumers about the options they have to improve their own financial resilience. Financial advisors' understanding of income protection, the product features and different options available, its suitability for different clients and how to convey all this effectively to clients has never been more important. And that's where iPaw comes in. Now, speaking of advisors, it's time to hear what our advisor panel are seeing in the market. Let's see what happened when Andrew caught up with Hannah Murray, Nina Brown, and one of our seven advisors, Mike Douglas. Thank you. So I'm delighted to be joined by Nina, Mike and Hannah to talk about their experiences around income protection as advisors on the front line over the last 12 months and hear some of their thoughts and predictions about what might be happening next. So before we crack into that, maybe if I could just ask you all to introduce yourselves, starting with you, Nina. Um, I'm Nina Brown from Pound Brown Mortgages. And I'm Mike Douglas from Woodside Financial Services. And I'm Hannah Murray from St James Place Protection Planning. Fantastic. Thank you. So I guess the first question, while I think everything else we talk about will be looking forwards and and all of that, naturally, it's a sensible time to look back over the last 12 months. So Nina, starting with you, how have you seen or have you seen any change or evolution in in clients' interest in income protection over the last year? Uh, Definitely. Um, It's definitely grown in the last 12 months, whether that's because of my interest in income protection or whether that's just because of the industry. Um, But it's definitely grown within people wanting more information, um, whether that being they're worried about what happens if they do get sick or most people most people associate income protection with unemployment and things like that, which is obviously then a mistake. But in terms of the growth, it's definitely grown in the last 12 months. That's good to hear. Thank you. Um, Mike, for you? I think people are talking about <clears throat> income protection a lot more than they, they ever did before. Um, whether that's on social media, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn a lot. I see a lot of great posts on there, a lot of engagement, which I never used to see before. Um, so I think that's beginning to sort of whip, grease the wheels, if you like. I think the interest and a little bit of education. Yeah, that's great. We'll definitely come back to that before the end of the session. I thought we might. Yeah. <laughs> and, and how about for you, Hannah? Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree there. I'm also finding more people are coming to me with a bit of knowledge already, which obviously means that the conversations are flowing a lot easier. They definitely see a need. And I think even COVID still kind of a conversation where people don't have that safety net that they used to. And it means that they are trying to find another solution now because trying to save at the moment, cost of living, everything else, it's just so, so much harder. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Nina, back to you. I'm interested in whether sort of digging into the detail of some of those answers, I guess. Have you seen a shift in how clients are choosing to prioritise or think about income protection within their broader financial planning portfolios over the last year? Does it, when you bring the subject up, does it does it cause a different reaction? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say a dramatic difference. Um, people still when they come obviously for a mortgage, people still just think of life insurance as the number one thing that they need to have. Um, So it's normally me that obviously then brings up the topic of income protection. Um, However, I have seen a shift in who asks for income protection more. It's definitely more younger clients now that actually have the knowledge. Um, Just say, for example, with social media, people are seeing it on social media more and people are now curious as to what that actually entails rather than just thinking you just need life insurance for the mortgage. That's interesting. So it's educating from a different, slightly different yeah. starting point sometimes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Is that similar for you, Mike, or different? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say so. I think um, what, I, what I do see is that uh, there's a lot of shift away from people looking like uh, uh, Nina just said, that uh, life insurance, critical illness is the first thing to, t- to talk about. To me, the ground uh, floor of any financial protection is 
income protection. You have to have that. Without that, you've got nothing else. So it's Monday today. We're just starting out on this week focused on income protection. Um, from your conversations with clients, are, what features, what products really resonate or make a difference, whether that's value-added services or some of the additional benefits? Um, are there, yeah, are there things that really kind of make a make that breakthrough for you? Yeah, I think they're definitely asking more about is there anything else that we can get? It's not as much just about, oh, the peace of mind that if I need to claim, I'll get a payout. They're seeing what they'll be able to use while they have the policy. Um, I think probably the biggest one is virtual GPs, having access to them because everyone I speak with, they can never get hold of their doctors. So having that peace of mind that they've got that alternative. Um, it also means that sometimes you can get your sick sick note through the virtual GP. So it means that you'll be able to actually get paid out quicker. So it's just kind of helping them with all of those bits. Yeah, that makes loads of sense. How about you, Nina? Uh, definitely. I focus my whole attention on the added services that you've received through a policy. Um, and it obviously depends on the client, but I would say I have a lot of younger clients. Um, things, I mean, the 24-7 GPs are fantastic and I've used them personally and they are fantastic. But that I would sell towards a family with children who want peace of mind that if they do need a GP for their children or for themselves and they can access that. But um, just say, for example, things like um, gym discounts and, you know, discounts on shoes and things like that. Um, I then focus that mainly on obviously the younger people who are more into their fitness and health because I have seen a very big trend in everyone now seems to care about their fitness and their health much more um, over the last 12 months. So adding that onto a policy and knowing that I always say you take out a policy and obviously the hope that you don't ever have to use the policy. So you may as well use something in the meantime. Um, so I definitely have my whole focus on all the added benefits that you do receive. And people come to me, just say, for example, with Vitality, they come to me knowing that with Vitality, you do get, you know, certain things that make it worthwhile having the policy. It's, it's easy for us to pretend that income protection is the be all and end all. And, you know, clearly that's not entirely the case for, for the three of you and everyone watching. Uh, and it, I guess as a reminder of that, this time last year when we were filming, I think it was in the middle of the, the trust government and you know try, trying to predict yes. what was happening next week was challenging. How, I guess, how have the changes economically affected advising on income protection, inflation, GIO, stuff like that? And again, how do you see that affecting your advice in the next, in the next few months? I think I, I always look at income protection first. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of it. And I think if if people are budget, and I hate the word budget, by the way, but if people are sort of cost conscious, then the, the thing that underpins everything, again, is income protection. It's the most important thing. If you can't work, you can't pay your bills. Um, well, I go through with the clients. The, <clears throat> on the fact find, the income and expenditure, me, to, to me, is the best part of it. Mm. You've got all of their income. Uh, sorry, you've got all of their expenditure, you know what their income is, and you just ask them the question, what's going to happen if you lose your income? This is all gone. Thank you, Mike. So um, for you, Hannah, how have you seen the kind of ec economic changes, uh, stability or lack of it affect affecting your clients? Yeah. So I would say I also see the budget uh, side of things with no matter how much people earn, but also um, how people don't trust their jobs anymore job security mm. has changed so much and so many kind of big companies are making cutbacks so i think people are looking more at their employer not trusting that they will be there to kind of help out um and some of them are even making the shift to saying actually employed doesn't work for me anymore i need to look at taking going out on my own uh, starting a business self-employed i'm speaking with a lot more people that have made that jump but they are very conscious still that they don't have that security anymore. So I'd say that they are definitely more of the people that I'm speaking with. Um, and it means that they prioritise that because they've made that big jump. They've got the flexibility with everything else. They just also want that security in place. That's really interesting. So in terms of those drivers, Nina, maybe coming to you to think about um, what are some of those motivations or sort of things that are triggering clients who, you know, to fall towards uh, choosing to buy income protection rather than maybe the ones who still shut you off in spite of all, all the efforts and all the techniques that, that you know you've learned over income protection awareness weeks over the years what what are those kind of triggers that 
that do kind of make someone uh, actually purchase it? Um, I think, like I just said, it's about trust. And I think not many people have trust in either the government anymore or their workplace. Um, so they know that they actually have to rely on themselves. And I think, again, it's, again, it's down to budget. But um, I think with the cost of living and the fact that not many people do actually have savings anymore, or it's very difficult to save money, um, showing them on a piece of paper everything that they actually spend every month and the fact that if they didn't have that one payment every month for their income they wouldn't be able to afford absolutely anything um so when people when you know when clients come to me and say they can't afford income protection if you can't afford it now how are you affording it when you then can't do your job um but yeah i think trust is the biggest thing at the moment i think each year it comes up in one way or another so it's good to get it out right at the start but that that still that fundamental is, is key isn't it what about for you mike when when you're talking with those clients kind of the motivations, the things you tend to hire from, hear from people who do end up going to buy income protection. What, what kind of things are there? I, th- I think it's explaining the, the the why, you know, why you should have it, why you shouldn't have it, and there's no reason why you shouldn't have it. There should only be two questions in income protection: Why have you got bought income protection? Why haven't you bought income protection? And just let the the client speak. Now, this next question is a, a biggie, and I promise not to kind of play it back to you in 12 months time but <laughs> it's basically trying to look forward and, and and get you to help predict based on market conditions what what you think will happen next right um and i guess we're keen to let actual advisors say this rather than you know fancy consultants who make their living from this so for you on the ground do you i guess do you think we've hit the peak of income protection or do you are you confident there's further to go where where are you on that i definitely think there's further to go i i see a shift in obviously more people are taking it out whether it's um, just kind of shorter term income protection full income protection they're prioritizing it a lot more Um, and I think it's because we're having these conversations and it does it scares you a little bit when you are asked could you afford the bills if this happened and you realize the answer is no or maybe for a couple weeks and that's it so I think we definitely haven't reached a peak it's just going to keep growing but I think it's about educating as many people as we can um, and just making it clear what income protection is because I would say it's probably what I would say it's easier to understand the critical and sometimes needed to explain it's not about what diagnosis you get it's not about what treatment you're on it's are you working if not is it because of an illness or an injury if the answer is yes then it will pay out it's as simple as that Nina, are you equally optimistic? <laughs> um, I am. Um, I think it's shocking. I think it what is six percent of people that have yeah. income protection. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's a very low number, um, but I know that it's growing. Um, so I can imagine. I can imagine over the next twelve months, hopefully, things do improve. Um, again, with the trust and the government and everything changing, I do think that will, in essence, help um, the fact that people now don't trust people as much, and therefore, hopefully people will realise that you have to protect yourselves. And income protection is, for me, the most simple policy to have because, like Hannah just said, if you can't work, income protection will pay out. I'm going to get carried away and risk going for another yes from you, Mike, but feel feel free to, no, uh, I think, to no. pop, pop my bubble. <laughs> <laughs> Without any doubt, um, it's uh, up, no, un, on an upward trajectory. Um, I like Matthew Chapman when he says, keep it super simple. If you try to overcomplicate it with a client, then they just switch off. Um, and if an advisor tries to give you all the deferment periods and the occupation and this, that, and the other, the client's going, oh, move on. So if you really just keep it really simple, explain what it does, what will happen if it doesn't happen, and then I think the clients will make their own mind up and just leave a silence. A client will feel that, and then pretty much you've, you've, you've got them, and you've uh, got them in a nice way. So we're feeling optimistic. Very I guess, optimistic. I guess I, I want to be the Simon Carroll in Britain's Got Talent. Do it. so it's four yeses in, it's ca- four in case yeses. it's not blindingly obvious where, where my There's vote would go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Plenty of ideas there. I hope that people are taking notes uh, as they watch. Um, and you mentioned education. So let, let, let's finish up on that, I think. Um, so I'm interested in, it's easy to throw around the word education and we yes. may have been guilty of it for the time so far, but just, just to kind of really get into specifics, Nina, what, what, what does that mean to you? What would you like to see yeah. us, us doing more um, of collectively? 
this this scares me because I yesterday I googled income protection for the first time. I'd never googled income protection before, um, and the information that I received it was completely misleading. And the first website I went onto, um, there was a few points which was I personally think were completely wrong. But um, one of the points was it said that you can't claim straight away when you get ill, which obviously you can. You can get a day mm. one deferment period. Um, the second one there was a checklist of why you shouldn't take out income protection. And one of them was because you get it through your mortgage. <laughs> I, I, I didn't understand how that was an option because obviously, as everybody should know, you, you don't get it through your mortgage. Um, and I think another one was about, it says income protection will pay out. And when it does pay out, it will have a payment until you either go back to work or you retire. But again, as everybody knows, you can get a short-term income protection plan. And then one of the first things was income protection for three pounds a month. Now, if someone's coming to me <laughs> thinking that they're going to get income protection for three pounds a month, and then I turn around and say it's going to be forty-five pounds a month, they're instantly going to think, "Well, surely I can get it much cheaper somewhere else." And therefore, they're going online and they're seeing all these policies and being completely missold. So I think when you do Google things, it is extremely bad. Um, but then there's things like LinkedIn and social media that when advisors are putting out the information, when they actually know what they're talking about, obviously that's great. Um, and hopefully that gets across and reaches much more people compared to the people that just go on these websites, which were very, you know, yeah. legitimate websites um, and get that like wrong information. It's a constant challenge, right, for us is in our bubble and in our social media bubble, mm -hmm. you can, you can, it can give you false hope, yes. I think, sometimes. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so now it is depression depressing but important yeah. to, to step outside that however we do what about you mike what does education mean to you the, education well, education for me with income protection the, the more i found out the more i learned the better i was and my income protection sales increased dramatically because i wasn't afraid to talk about it i could actually answer the questions i could give reasons why and kept it simple uh, that was a massive help um, in education terms um, again, Matthew Chapman's getting another mention. The Let's Talk IP, those eight episodes, every single advisor should be listening to those and they will increase their income protection sales um, for the good of their customer. Um, so, yeah, ed ed education, it's so important. Help me and it help everybody else. Yeah, that's brilliant, Mike. To be, to be clear, I'll do the look to camera for this. So Let's Talk <laughs> IP, the podcast that Mike mentioned, is a, a podcast that we've done for advisors uh, from Matt Chapman this year. And, and as you say, the, the intent is... I guess in a similar way to this week to give that focus useful education. Um, coming to you last, Hannah, uh, education, whether for consumers, real people, I always want to call them. I'm aware you are, <laughs> you are also real people. Where, 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 where would you, if you, if you had the, the budget to education, where would you be spending it? So one of the things that um, my company are looking at doing is going kind of later this year, going to a local school to speak with firstly, like the teachers, just to kind of discuss um, all sorts of areas for protection, but income protection as well for them. Um, and I think focusing on the teachers and then hopefully being able to also speak to some of the kids, because let's face it, overall financial education it's not what it should be at all. Um, and I think most of the times that people actually start talking about income protection or insurance in general is when they get a mortgage, but that's later and later now. Um, so I think the earlier that we can reach people and the different ways we can reach people, so like the podcast, easy listening, it's not just a kind of article that you've got to read through it's very easy to access and easier to understand and that's the point easy it's the yes. way forward really yeah a brilliant way to end i think uh, so hannah mike nina thank you so much for your for your time and bringing kind of real advisors in into the week um we'll we'll take those thoughts with us through uh, with that back to the studio it was so interesting to hear the different perspectives from around the market and encouraging to hear of advisors' experiences as part of their client conversations. It would be great to hear more from advisors. Why not share your experiences online using our hashtags? This year, IPTF partnered with the Consumer Duty Alliance to collaborate on working to support vulnerable customers.
we caught up with the chief executive of the CDA, Keith Richards, to talk about the impact the consumer duty has had so far. Hello, thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Vicky Churchill from the IPTF and I'm delighted to be joined by Keith Richards. Um, Keith is CEO of the Consumer Duty Alliance um, and Keith is going to tell us a little bit about the work that Consumer Duty Alliance do and how Consumer Duty is looking one year on. If I can start by asking you, Keith, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and how the Consumer Duty Alliance came about? Yeah, of course. And thanks for asking, Vicky. Um, so I've spent uh, 40 years in uh, retail financial services. I started my career in, uh, uh, in insurance and I've held uh, a number of senior uh, exec roles throughout that time, including head of retail for Royal London Group, uh, managing director for Tenet Group, CEO of the Personal Finance Society, which also encompassed chief membership officer for the Chartered Insurance Institute. Uh, I've pretty much held a regulatory role, a control function role, uh, from the day that regulation came into force back in the, the mid 80s. Um, so I'm pretty well uh, averse to all of the regulatory change that's shaped effectively and reshaped this sector throughout. The Consumer Duty Alliance is a indepe truly independent, not for profit body. Uh, its board are all pro bono and it has no commercial output. So it's about bringing together uh, retail financial services to work a bit more collaboratively um, from a sharing of good practice uh, and uh, the development or the supporting the implementation of consumer-focused outcomes. The rules to us are a significant change. So we agree with the regulator that this is uh, uh, this is a seismic change, a huge change of direction for the FCA away from prescriptive based rules uh, to ones of outcomes focus, which actually mean that everyone in the organization now has a responsibility. So the Consumer Duty Alliance is really about bringing together uh, the, the whole sector together um, and, and also augmenting the great work of many of the established firms that already provide services across the sector. I hosted a Q&A session with you back in July. And one of the things you've referenced quite a lot is about a tick box exercise. So what reassurance can you offer advisors and people in the insurance industry that consumer duty is not just another thing to do? Why is it important rather than just being a burden or, or a tick box exercise as, as you referenced back in July? Yeah, well, if we think about it, Vicky, the, it's the first piece of regulatory reform and terminology that the sector owned before regulation came into effect. In other words, every good firm believes that it focuses on the delivery of the best outcomes for its customers or its clients. Um, so the reason this is so important is it's almost giving back the whole industry the opportunity to influence the future direction of travel, a move away from prescriptive rules, often frustrated good firms because they felt that they were being victimized for some bad players in the, the sector and the regulator was effectively implementing rules based on the lowest common denominator, which by definition means that good firms uh, that weren't guilty were having to comply with the same sort of rules. So it often felt quite bureaucratic and I you know, might add in many ways, we, we introduced changes to our processes that didn't add any value to the end consumer whatsoever. In fact, I would say that uh, being on various boards that we often signed off against changes to processes that hindered good consumer outcomes, that probably confused consumers more. Um, so I think now this is giving the power back to the boards uh, and the management teams, and in fact, everyone in, in business to really focus on if it doesn't deliver against the consumer duty outcomes expected, then you shouldn't be doing it. In other words, if you're bundling a load of forms out to a consumer that's adding no value, then you should be not doing it. Uh, so it's getting our head around what that means. So, you know, adding another 26 pieces of paper onto a suitability report is easy, taking them off is now where we're going to have the opportunity to look at how we deliver much better uh, outcomes for our customers and how we change our, our 
processes and services to support that. And of course, we could save a few trees in the process, which is always a which is always a bonus. Um, we often hear Keith people talking about vulnerable customers. What kinds of uh, people would be considered vulnerable? Is it somebody who has uh, an obvious disability challenge? Yeah, it's a great question, Vicky. And I think, uh, I mean, some, some of the FCA recent uh, research demonstrated that uh, within the wealth management sector, 49% of uh, wealth managers felt that they didn't have any vulnerable customers, but more startlingly, 69% of stockbrokers didn't think they had any vulnerable customers. And I think it's the terminology that we use which stigmatizes the word vulnerable customer with age-related cognitive impairment or an identifiable disability, which of course firms would need to address someone with, for example, an eyesight problem, a hearing disability. But what they're also focusing on is people that are in temporary periods of vulnerable circumstance. The interesting change from the FCA, I might add, has moved away from vulnerable customer to vulnerable circumstances. So in other words, we've now got to look at, so if someone came to us, uh, an existing client, for example, or customer with a bereavement in the family or going through divorce, uh, we would recognize those as potential circumstances that need us to give additional care and attention to this customer given the circumstances that they're facing and we might offer them additional help and support because of their circumstance. So uh, this shift away from vulnerable customer to the circumstances, the vulnerable circumstances that people face is quite a, a significant shift and I think we've got to think about the role that we perform is often actually helping people mitigate vulnerable circumstances. So sometimes consumers come to us because they're experiencing a life change, which actually can be uh, vulnerable. Someone, for example, inheriting money who's never invested before is now in a vulnerable circumstance because they've got no real experience of the investment market. Uh, they don't really, they've never experienced the volatility of, of the way markets go up and down. So you would need to take extra care and attention when actually guiding that client on any products or services that you have to offer uh, and any ongoing support that you provide. So vulnerability, I think, is, is a word that we, we've just got to use internally. We've got to think about what the FCA are really asking us to do is demonstrate that we recognize circumstances that may need additional consideration, help or support. Okay, that's that's really interesting because, I mean, IPOR stands for, well, it used to stand for Income Protection Awareness Week. We changed awareness to action. And I think that's a really good action for everybody listening today to think, are we using the right terminology for vulnerable customers? Should we should we consider even internally changing that? Because if we, we talk about it internally, sometimes it slips out, you know, when we're talking to customers. So that's really interesting. Um, and finally, Keith, can I ask, uh, what top tips can you share with firms who want to make absolutely sure that they are compliant with the consumer duty? How how can how can you know consumer duty alliance help? What top tips would you give us? Yeah, thanks, Vicky. I mean, the first thing is rest assured that this is an ongoing journey. So your regulator has already stressed that this is not a one and done exercise. This is an ongoing evolutionary process. Uh, to deliver the right set of, of outcomes. So uh, as long as the regulator can see that you've been doing your assessment at the early stage, looking at any gaps you've got in your processes and services, then you're probably on the right track. Now, what we've provided through the Alliance is a free self-assessment tool. It's very easy to go through. It will provide you uh, with a dashboard of all the key areas that the regulator expects you to have addressed in your consumer duty requirements. It also helps you link straight away to certain aspects of, of the rules, so direct into the FCA's website, uh, and also some resources that we've provided as, as good practice to help people benchmark. So things like the new board reporting, we've got a full guide on um, to help firms because there's a new deadline coming up on the first anniversary that includes the need for an annual uh, um, strategy or board report. Uh, or for small firms, we might call it a business plan that incorporates all the, all the aspects of consumer duty outcomes. So uh, free tool, 
uh, is the first stage of, you know, go onto our website, pick up the, the, the free tool. It's www.consumerduty.org. Uh, but in addition, don't try to mark your own homework. So whether you're large or small, do bring in some external expertise. There's lots of great compliance support services and consultants in the market who can offer you uh, a much, much quicker assessment and give you the confidence of where you're on track and where perhaps there's gaps that you need to address. FCA don't mind there being gaps, by the way. So I think you know, the re- really important thing is that none of us profess to be perfect. So where you've got gaps, just identify them and then put a plan in place of how you're going to take remedial action to address that gap. That's what the regulator is going to be expecting. Okay, thanks, Keith. That was really great and really interesting. Um, and um, for all our viewers watching today, IPTF is actually an affiliate of the Consumer Duty Alliance um, and highly recommend that you do look at them. Um, and uh, Keith, can you just remind us of that email address again, please? Certainly. Of, of your website address, sorry. Of course. It's www.consumerduty.org. Perfect. Great. A great action there for everybody. Nice way to end. Thank you very much for joining us, Um, Keith. It's been fantastic. I've learned lots. I hope everybody else has too. Thank you. Thanks, Keith and Vicky. It's great to get an update on Consumer Duty one year on. Now I have the pleasure of speaking to Paul Roberts, Proposition and Distribution Director at CI Expert about their report, Critical Thinking 2024. Paul. Welcome to the studio. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So there are a couple of reasons that we wanted to include this conversation as part of IPOL. Obviously, we want to discuss your Critical Thinking uh, 2024 report, um, which was out earlier this year. But we also often get asked uh, whether advisors should be talking about critical illness or income protection. Um, We wanted to be very clear about that and tackle that first of all head on. We are obviously the Income Protection Task Force, but it doesn't mean that we're anti-CI. Um, our reasons for championing IP relate to the fact that historically it's always been undersold, um, and we believe it's the cornerstone of financial planning um, because all other plans rely on income. Um, actually, I've heard those very words from uh, your colleague, Alan Lakey, at, at CI Expert. So the reality is that these products face a number of similar issues and challenges, and many of those came out in your report. So I thought it might be useful to take a look at a few of those. So when we we think about increasing sales of protection, there are a couple of options that spring to mind immediately. We can increase demand for the product by raising consumer awareness, as we've just touched on, or we can sell more by adapting the way that we're selling. Uh, So let's take the latter of those, the advice process. Um, And again, if we refer to your critical thinking report, um, several interesting points came out of that. Um, We're going to look at the important role that advisor mindset and the belief in what they're doing and the products that they're selling um, have. Can you tell us more about what the research uncovered about advisor assumptions about budget and affordability? It's quite clear that the assumptions made on the affordability of a client is made by the advisor themselves, often before they've spoken to the client and actually assess what their needs are. And I think like many of us, when we, when we seek advice, we do it with people that we trust. We find those people and we, we engage with them. We explain the situations and we explain the, the challenges and the opportunities, that we're, the challenges we're looking to solve. And we trust them to give us the best advice. We don't ask them how much it's going to cost. We ask them to, in a situation to give us their best advice. And in circumstances like this, advisors watching this program, you can do that from tomorrow. It's very difficult to change a product. It's quite unrealistic to expect a product provider to change their products quickly. But everybody watching this can change their advice process tomorrow. One of the findings that we've was clear in the report is that education is key and everybody watching this program could reach out into the community, into their schools tomorrow. You can change your advice process. You can do things in different ways and you can do them by placing the interests of the consumer, your client, at the fundamental core of everything you do and the quality of the advice that you give is the advice that they trust you to give them. 
Love that. Yeah, this week, uh, this year, we've changed Income Protection Awareness Week to, to Action Week, and it's really good. That's a, a great idea that someone can take away straight away. Um, and I think it's a theme that we're going to see all through this week is, is advisors having confidence in the advice that they're giving and really believing in it. Yes, you invite your clients trust you. Absolutely. And it's the trust that is clear that we need to encourage everybody on this call to engender with their clients, not just on the day they sell a policy, but on the day, every day afterwards to make sure that they're in contact with them every year. Every time something changes, every time their personal circumstances change, they come back to the advisor because they trust them to do the right thing. So finally, I'd like to to finish touching on value-added services um, as it's, it's how we're going to end our week this week. Um, there was some encouraging news in your report about how often advisors are talking about value-added services and how integral they are to the protection proposition. Um, can you Can you share with us what you found? Yeah, they're tremendously important uh, features of modern day protection plans, and they will become increasingly so as people become more aware of them. And it's it's a tremendous development. And these, um, I think they were first introduced by Scandia and Pathway to Life back in the, uh, you have to excuse me on the date on that one. But and since then, they've evolved, and they've evolved uh, dramatically. And it's really important that everybody that sells a modern day life critical and also income protection plan considers the value that health and well-being services give to their, not just the policyholder, but again, it's their families where they're dependents and all of which are designed to either help on single use added value services, so GP 24-7 or whatever that might be, but not to forget that you have lifetime worth of added value services that support people through all sorts of different uh, stages of their life when it comes to mental health or when it comes to bereavement, all sorts of things. These are all inbuilt into the plans available today. And it's important for everybody to have a regular dialogue with their customers to keep them up to date with what they have, how they change, how they can use them, but not to forget about them. And when you build your client annual review into your program is to make sure that you include a section on the added value services that may or may not be available within the plans. Because unless you tell them, your clients might not know about them. And if they don't know about them, they can't use them. So again, we're all in this together. Our, our role is to provide information that allows people to deliver the best possible outcome for they can for their clients, their dependents, and their families and their businesses. And the reason we do this is because we need to ensure that when people are in a difficult position, that they have the comfort and the support that they need from products that we make available that you sell and advise on that deliver the outcomes that you have been asked to deliver by your clients because they've trusted you to give them the best advice that you can. Great point. Um, So thank you so much for joining us here today, Paul. It's been really interesting to hear more about critical thinking. Um, I think, again, it's worth reiterating for our audience that we're not pitting CI and IP against each other. As you've mentioned, they are slightly different products that do slightly different things. The skill of the advisor, as I, I think this conversation has shown, is to position the products as aligning to the client's objectives um, and empowering clients to make an informed decision about what they they need. Um, There was a great quote actually in your report, which sums this up really nicely, which was perception is the reality that informs consumer decisions. Um, I think that that really captures uh, the report very nicely. Uh, So thank you so much for producing this report, which highlights the role that we all have to play in shaping consumer perceptions and ultimately their decisions. Thank you. This year at IPOR, based on feedback from last year, we're including coaching elements each day in line with our mission to turn awareness into action. We start today with a conversation from Julie Botha from Vitality about advisor mindset and understanding how clients might react to protection conversations. So welcome, Julie, to the first coaching session of IPOR week. Well, thanks for having me, Joe. 
So today we're going to start by looking at advisor mindset. We're going to consider the role of an advisor and the responsibility that they have. We're going to begin by looking at the sort of opposition that advisors might face in their client conversations, understanding what's going on from the client's perspective and how advisors can successfully tweak their approach and navigate the resistance that they might face to successfully convey the value of IP. So let's begin by looking at some of the reasons advisors think people don't value protection and IP. People don't see the value in protection because there's nothing tangible. You're paying for something that you might never need. Buying a shiny car, for example, gives you something that's much easier to justify. For under 40s, they don't think long-term illnesses will happen to them as they are young and fit. And death, well, that's a million miles away. How do you respond to a client who has optimism bias? I've never taken a day off work sick and I don't see the need of income protection or critical illness. People don't see the value in protection because to create the value, you have to help them look at a mirror, show them what might happen and most importantly, how it affects those around them. Some will look with you and some simply can't look for fear and it's a tough job to get them to open their eyes. Do we make it more complicated by trying to explain budget cover, full cover, waiting periods? Then we do the application and invariably end up with exclusions. Trying to explain all this um, to the client can be information overload. I find people have the misconception that it's just insurance, it doesn't pay out, and very often confuse it all with PPI. Financial protection doesn't always come to the forefront of minds because it doesn't happen that often and often only the people that take it out will have seen it happen to people close to them or they've seen it happen in their everyday lives. I'm not the main breadwinner. My family will support me indefinitely and I still live at home. My parents pay all the bills. I don't see the need to protect my income. For over 40s, often by then, they are likely to have had some illness which will impact on them for the rest of their lives, so they don't believe they will get cover, and even if they can, it will be expensive with high premiums. So, advisors really do have their jobs cut out for them. I think of, um, of all the, the, the comments, the one that really stood out to me was this idea of optimism bias. And I know that in our workshops, we often ask advisors, like, what are those barriers that clients have in terms of seeing the value of protection? And always the first one that comes up is that optimism bias, that idea that it's just not going to happen to me. Or... It might happen to me, but it's not going to happen to me now. I'll think about it a little bit later. And and I think that optimism is, I mean, we know it's a really, really good thing. It helps us to persevere through difficulties. It helps us to be positive and you know, make an impact on this world. But it's not a good thing when it comes to us seeing the value of protection. So what can we say to, to younger clients? I think... Really, for me, it starts with education. And I mean, Tracy pointed that out when she commented to say that, you know, a lot of people find it complicated. They just don't understand um, insurance. And that's maybe why they have a barrier or they don't actually see the value of it. So first and foremost, I think our role is to educate. And when it comes to younger people, I always like to kind of start off with explaining the mortality curve to them. And I, I mean, I remember when I joined the industry, that was the first thing that I learned. Like the younger you are, the lower your risk, therefore the lower your premium and the higher, you know, the older you are, the higher your risk and therefore the higher your premium. But I think what younger people need to understand is that that mortality or morbidity curve is not a linear curve. It kind of has got this hump in the middle and it goes up when you're in your 20s and early 30s and then it comes down again. And explaining to younger people like why that that hump is there Mm -hmm. and it really is because when you're in your 20s and 30s, you're engaging in more risky behavior. You know, we do silly things mm-hmm. when we're younger. <laughs> when we're older, we're a lot more um, conservative and we take less risks. Mm-hmm. And and introducing that concept um, to them and letting them understand that, for example, when we, when we have a look at our uh, 2024 claims and benefits report, our youngest IP claimant was 21. 
for a spinal injury. Yeah. And so when you are talking to a younger client, it's about not necessarily talking about the risk of heart attacks, cancers and strokes. Mm -hmm. It's talking about you could come back from a ski holiday with a spinal injury. That, that's yeah. something that they can relate to. Yeah. Um, the other thing I think that, that really stands out from an IP claim perspective with the younger generations or what, what they can relate to is mental and behavioral conditions. So last year we paid out 19% um, of our IP claims were for mental and behavioral conditions. I mean, that's mm. almost one in five. Yeah. Again, something I think that younger people can certainly relate to um, when it comes to them going, okay, so that I, that I definitely understand. The other thing I think that's really important to help younger clients to see the value of protection is to talk to them and educate them around this concept of uninsurability. So we understand uninsurability, we appreciate it because we're in the industry and we see underwriting decisions all the time. Mm -hmm. But I don't think, you know, the average man in the street actually understands that. And when we talk about uninsurability, it's getting across the point that Something as simple as an abnormal smear, something as simple as having a time of work for a mental or behavioral condition can actually have adverse consequences yeah. in the future for you getting protection. And, and I think that, you know, getting clients to that point of really appreciating that they can't necessarily wait because things could happen in between, especially when we talk about things that resonate with young people mm -hmm. like trauma and mental and behavioral conditions. Um, one of the questions I know that I heard an advisor say, which I absolutely love, is you ask your client the question, like, which of my clients do you think truly value protection? Like the most, do you think it's the younger people with families or is it um, older people who are you know, earning a lot of money or is it people with a mortgage? And it's not. It's those that can't get insurance are the ones that value insurance the ones most and the ones that want insurance the most. And, you know, we don't want you to be in that situation at all. Yeah. Absolutely. So as you've shown, there's plenty of evidence that we can call upon, plenty of ways to explain the need for income protection to tackle that optimism bias, particularly when we're talking to younger clients. But when we think about the traditional advice process, um, there isn't much focus on the education uh, or helping clients see that that need for IP. If we think about fact finds, they're typically very numbers based. They ask questions around things like debt, budget, affordability. So what can we add to that process to more effectively help clients see the need for IP? So I think adding questions over and above what you would normally ask in your fact find. Um, you know, the fact find has a really, really important role to play, but I think it does definitely cover the logical side of the process and not necessarily the emotional yeah. side. So asking questions that I always say, like getting clients to think about a problem that they didn't even know that they had. Yeah. You know, there's many ways that we can actually do that in order to get them to just stop for a moment and think like that's what we what we really want to go for. So one of the things I think um, when I joined Vitality, one of my first roles was working with the health telesales call centers, the inbound centers where clients would call in um, and, and inquire about protection. And I remember overhearing the first call and the first question that they asked was, what prompted you today to give us a call about private medical insurance? Mm -hmm. And I think that that question is incredibly powerful because the person would either say, well, my friend has just been diagnosed with a heart condition and they're on this long waiting list um, and I don't want to be there one day, mm -hmm. which, which is fantastic because that allows you then to explore that further. Or I'm just so tired of waiting for my GP um, to get an appointment, yes. you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. The other thing that sometimes people would say, as you can imagine, is I've just been diagnosed with cancer and I need to access private medical treatment. Yeah. So either way, whatever comes out of that question is a really good starting point for any conversation going forward. So I thought, well, obviously we don't have clients phoning us, asking us about IP. It yeah. would be great if we did. Um, but maybe we could tweak it to say, has anything ever prompted you to think about taking out income protection? Mm -hmm. And again, if they say yes, that's fantastic. You can explore that further. And if they say no, well, then there's a role of our education, right? Yeah. But but I think it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was Nicola who was saying that a lot of the time people actually just don't want to 
go down the route of talking about that need because they fear it so much. And so I think sometimes when a client says, uh, no, I've never really thought about it or nothing has prompted me. I think it often is a smoke screen mm. that in fact, it's not really what they feel, but it's that fear of I don't really want to go down that road with you right now. The other question, of course, which links really well onto that is simply asking how concerned are you? How concerned are you um, that you would become unable to work because of an illness or injury? And again, if they are concerned, fantastic, explore that. If they aren't concerned, then it's an opportunity to educate. Yeah. So the mortgage has long been an obvious trigger for protection conversations, but we're really keen that IP conversations aren't only happening because of mortgages, particularly given, as we've said, the younger you are when you take out IP, generally the easier it will be. So let's consider those clients who haven't yet got on the property ladder, who don't have their mortgage sorted and but are hoping to, to do that at some point. And I, th- I think that's the key. Like, I d- I've never met somebody who's renting a property and wants to rent for the rest of their lives. They're renting a property because they are working on one of two things, either saving for a deposit or working on their credit score. And those two things, I think, um, are so important to educate a client about the impact that will, if you are unable to work because of an illness or injury, would have on your savings goal or your credit score. So again, asking questions like how important is it to you to work on your credit score? I mean, I don't think anyone's going to say it's not important. Uh, Like most people will say yes. And then what a brilliant opportunity to say, well, that's why income protection is so important. Or you know, we know that you, I know that you're saving towards um, your deposit and think about, walk me through what the impact would be on your savings pot if you needed to draw down on that for, let's say, one, two, three, or even five years, which is your average IP claim length. Like, what impact would that have on your goal, your financial goal to save so that you could buy a home? Yeah. Again, just another way of them going, hmm, I never, I never really thought about that. I mean, yeah. that's what you're trying to create through these questions. Yeah, and usually the maths doesn't add up, right? So, exactly. Yeah. So I'm very conscious that not all of our advisors watching will be mortgage having mortgage conversations. Um, so let's think about this from the perspective of uh, the wealth advisors who are watching. So what kind of questions could could they add to their fact finds? I think as well, um, wealth advisors have a have a big advantage in that they use cash flow modeling tools. Yes. And so the use of a cash flow modeling tool is is probably, I think, one of the most powerful ways to show somebody what the impact would be, mm-hmm. either if they had to stop work early because of an illness or injury, or if they had to take two or three years off. Um, you know, it's in black, well, it's not in black and white, it's in red and blue and green. And and so asking, uh, and again, we're not talking about asking questions that will instill fear. We're not talking about salesy questions. We're talking about really kind of objective questions. For example, if you were unable to work because of an illness or injury, would you consider drawing down on the savings that you are putting towards your retirement? Yeah. And the answer would probably be, well, I suppose I'd have to. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, the question is, okay, so would you prefer to extend your retirement date or take a lower income in retirement? I'm busy here with the cash flow modeling tool. It's going to be one or the other. And if you had to ask me that, it would be neither. Thank you. (laughs) I'm not retiring any later than Mm -hmm. I'd planned and I'm not taking a lower income. Mm -hmm. And so just introducing that we're talking about a risk to your future plans, to your retirement, to your yeah. dreams and your goals. And, and that, I think, is, is a great way, together with actually showing it on a graph, is a fantastic way to get a client to see the need. So thank you, Julie. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us where people can find out more if they want to follow up on this session. Yes. Yeah, so on the Vitality Academy, we have a digital learning module called Sales as a Force for Good, uh, where we've recorded some videos and we have some bite-sized content um, all around the psychology of selling. So that would be a good place to go. Fantastic. So in the spirit of this being Income Protection Action Week, there's the first action for our advisors. There you go. <laughs> Thanks, Judy, so much for joining us today. Thanks, Joe. It's been a pleasure. We're nearly at the end of day one of IPOR, but fear not, 
If you're craving more income protection knowledge, there is plenty going on this week. LNG are running a series of webinars each day following our broadcasts. Aviva are running a series of webinars next week with an IP focus. iPipeline will be running income protection focused webinars and Underwrite Me will be running demonstrations of their protection platform with an income protection focus this week too. That is just a taste of what's going on. Keep an eye on social media for news of other events and we'll share all events in our daily bulletins this week. So make sure you've subscribed to those on our website. Well, that just about brings us to the end of day one of IPOR. We hope that the content has inspired you to try something new and most importantly, that you reach new clients to share the importance of income protection. Tune in tomorrow to hear all about what you can do to best prepare for client meetings to ensure delivery of successful protection outcomes. See you there.